Okay, hi everybody, here we are again, another day, another dollar, or lack of one, and um, here we are back at Menla, again, in my favorite place, a room that was blessed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who, uh, right, sitting right over there on the raised platform, uh, bestowed the Medicine Buddha consecration here, initiation, in this room upon a bunch of doctors and, uh, and yogis and, uh, and just friendly people. It was a wonderful day, that was. Uh, maybe 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, Medicine Buddha, the reason for bestowing that is if you are a healer and you're concerned you want to help others, then... I mean, without necessarily, even you're not a doctor, say you're a parent or you want to try to heal your child, not, you know, if possible, by common sense, you know, small level of thing, you don't want to rush to the hospital at all times. In fact, the hospital, you can likely get sick, <laughs> dangerous a little bit, but you have to go if you have extreme stuff. And, um, and doctor, you go regularly, and that's all fine, but also you try to do healing at home. So the point is, if, you do, if you're a caretaker in some way, then there's a danger of burnout. And um, what Medicine Buddha is, is a form the Buddha manifested. Buddha's, or a Buddha, historically, yes, the Buddha did, but a Buddha does in any world, any universe, since the Buddhists think there are many different humanoid and, and uh, sentient being worlds. And they manifest in this form that is supposedly the ideal healer conveys the ideal placebo effect to the sick person to make them feel they can be healed and therefore they mobilize their own immune system and so on, and healing system. And uh, so as to encourage people to be healed and to, to rely on the wisdom of their own body and feel their body is on their team and that they are allied with it and so on. Because life, the life force is their happy, happiness and their confidence and their joy. And their sense, their deepest inner feeling of feeling that they are, that reality, okay, is, has something good in store for them. And they're not afraid of reality and feel that reality is going to get them and they have to hide from it or something like that. Wisdom is bliss, you know. That means that ignorance is not bliss. Not knowing reality is not bliss. Knowing reality is bliss, that means. Wisdom means you really know reality by communing with it, by being one with it. That's how you know it ultimately. You know it as an object getting more and more reasonable, more and more investigating, more and more observing, but the ultimate goal is to know it by communing with it. And that's the ultimate scientific achievement. Okay, so here we go. We stopped in mid-section, and um, any enlightenment, and I'll, a little bit going back, I'd read this briefly before in the previous one, Back to Wisdom is Bliss. I did want at the beginning of this session, one thing I wanted to pay respect to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, my, my teacher, my root teacher today, in that he is, he studied like mad, he experimented in reality, he looked at it, he talked to also modern scientists, he talked to ancient, he studied all the greatest ancient scientists, and he is amazing. And uh, I, we have a biography of him called The Man of Peace, the illustrated biography of His Holiness of the Dalai Lama of Tibet. I don't, we didn't use His Holiness in that case, the Dalai Lama of Tibet, because we were dealing with his individual life and how he came to his learning, and how he used this curriculum in his own way, even though the Tibetan form of the monastic university was shattered, but he rebuilt the huge ones in India in exile anyway with the, some of his uh, fellow people and some Mongolians who escaped from various communists in different places in Tibet and Mongolia, and also Chinese foreign Westerners as well. And he is now building a fabulous one in Bodh Gaya to go beyond, to carry on the legacy and to rebuild the great Indian libraries of Alexandria that were the monastic universities and their libraries and their faculties and so forth and their students and uh, their impact on that wonderful country, making that really happy country until they were conquered, you know. So I just want to pay respect to that. I want to promote that book, Man of Peace. You find it on Amazon. Illustrated life story of his own Siddhartha. Om Ah Vajra Guru. Om Ah Guru Vajradharas. Manjushri 
Vakindra Sumati Shasana Dara Samudra Sri Bhada Savasiddhi Hum. That's his mantra. And that brings in presence. So I like to do that. Any enlightenment-oriented curriculum, for example, that of the new Nalanda University in India and of the new Dalai Lama University as well in India, should be based on, which will be, that's a virtual new Nalanda one, should be based on the three super-educations of the Eightfold Path. And the upshot is that once liberated in the reality of freedom, hey, once liberated in the reality of freedom, how's that for connecting to democracy, by the way, one comes to see the beauty of the world, the joy of living as a sentient being, compassionately interconnected with all sentient life. So America, what is America? America, why do people like it? Why do they all want to come here to America from other places? Because of democracy. Because democracy is somehow that all men are equal is the essence of it. And therefore, it doesn't mean that people will, everybody's different, of course. But equal means that they're equal in opportunity. And therefore, but they make different uses of that, therefore they're different. But the democracy acknowledges that and doesn't force people to be like other people. Because it's based on a feeling of freedom. And so, terrible misuse of that feeling of freedom is free to harm freedom to harm other people. And we too much did like that. Uh, that was, that's the savage, materialistic, nihilistic business. That, 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 that we manifested, which is terrible and dangerous. But on the other hand, freedom also means free to be creative, free to make beauty, free to see beauty, and therefore not want to harm others, free to love. And that's, the, that's a good use of the freedom, and that we did. And therefore, Michael Jackson, we export Michael Jackson, we exported Satchmo Louis Armstrong, we exported you know, all kinds of beautiful things. And then that's why. And then people loved the Hollywood. And they loved our movies. And they loved, they loved it. And they sensed the freedom in that and the beauty in that freedom. The soft power. So we, we lived up to Ashoka's theory that the Indians taught, the great emperor Ashoka of India, who was 3rd century BCE, right after Alexander the Great. Instead of trying to conquer the Persians and the Greeks and this and that, and the Egyptians, uh, after Alexander tried to conquer India and failed, instead of Indians then going to get him, they did exported. They exported their freedom idea. They did Dharma conquest, soft power conquest, showing how a society that appreciates beauty, that elevates people discovering inner freedom and enlightenment and gets educated, does the super educations, will create more beauty. And then that will be then they will conquer others by lifestyle, not by an invasion, <laughs> not by force. All right? That's the Dharma Vijaya, it's called. Right? It, third century before the common era, a time when we had our Alexanders and our Roman empires, and China had its Han dynasties. Although, and, the, and the Ashoka, uh, uh, Ashoka Dharma Vijaya, Dharma conquered China too. There's a wonderful book called The Buddhist Conquest of China and through soft power. Not too military. And that was really wonderful. Okay. So I'm just honoring Dalai Lama for that and, and honoring that, 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 that instead of just fantasizing such a university, there's one being built now again on the planet, thank heavens. And the upshot is that once liberated in the reality of freedom, one comes to see the beauty of the world, the joy of living as a resilient being compassionately interconnected with all sentient life. Such evolved and enlightened students break free of arbitrary limits to their curiosity and then naturally launch into the specialty sciences known nowadays as physics, biology, psychology, botany, and so forth. And the many arts such as literature, medicine, law, engineering, politics, diplomacy is an art, and computer science. I didn't notice I don't put political science because that would be diplomacy if it was proper. Our political science in, in our university, it caters to the idea of violence being the only controlling thing, which is unrealistic, actually, because violence doesn't control. It, it liberates chaos, in fact. So by only understanding violence and not understanding soft power conquest and soft power diplomacy and not having State Department more well-funded than Pentagon, 
then they are not understanding their real role in the future. I, I agree, <laughs> thanks to the Pentagon. We didn't have Hitler, we won't have Putin, we won't have Netanyahu, we won't have horrible Ayatollahs and people, we won't have bad uh, Xi Jinping's, bad communist dictators, we won't have. So in, for, in, on, in a way, it's necessary, it's a point. So it's evolved in enlightenment, so they break free of that and they do that. And then such genius students will automatically pursue advanced research that is mindful and ethical. And part of their research will be into their own minds and their own ability to develop samadhi, total concentrated, total concentration, cultivated as an ability. They will develop that. And, uh, and critical, analytical, much more penetrating. And they will learn to be able to sit like I am sitting here, not like the El Pensero, uh, you know, Rodin's thinker does, who could never maintain that posture for an hour to really think deeply about something, never. Such genius students uh, and such scientists are, uh, see ethics as a biological evolutionary necessity, which is the relevant understanding, and thus are not distracted from their driving motivation to improve the lives of themselves and all others. You see there, you see, if you understand karma, that's the biology, that's the, the, that's the ur biological theory. And if you understand karma properly, and you can fit it in with Darwinian detail, that's fine, but you don't subject it to materialist dogma, so therefore you see the individual as re reaping the fruits in continuum of lives of their evolutionary actions, not just a species, not just genes, not just some micro uh, physical objects, and not some macro physical objects like, like bodies, species, or just, just genes which are micro bodies that control bodies. You don't, you don't get stuck in other of those levels by not being stuck in materials. You can see details of those things, why not? But you, you, you realize mind works through that, all of that. Mind is, carries the subtle causal processes. Epigenetic environment has to do with mind. And interactions and behavior of species in their nest and not destroying it and not destroying each other has to do with, uh, with bodies, with bodies that don't need this kind of violence and bodies that are not have, carrying the emotional plague and are deeply feeling the beauty of themselves and they're feeling their inner beauty and inner streaming and their inner life force and health force. That's the kind of bodies you want. So that's, I'll come back to that more when we get to realistic ethics itself, karma. So they're not distracted from their driving motivation, which is the driving motivation of all scientists. Why Lama loves them to improve the lives of themselves and all others. An enlightenment-oriented core curriculum should seek to produce ethical persons as a first prerequisite. That's what the Dalai Lama, when he got his honorary degree at Columbia, he said, I love education, it's the greatest thing. Thank you, I'm honored to have this uh, Dr. Arts or Honoris Causa, Dr. Of, of, of whatever, Honoris Causa. But about this education here at this university, I have to, as your colleague, I have therefore, as I have to say, you focus too much only on the clever brain and not enough on the good heart. You don't produce the warm-hearted person, the good-hearted person. You don't, you know, decency, you mention decency, you mentioned ethicality, but you don't produce it, which is something you have to do by getting people to think it through. And you use me making a study and the development of that. You have to connect it to reality, ethics, because ethics is part of reality. And it grows from reality and becomes realistic to be ethics. Then people will internalize ethical codes. Just out of dogma and fiat, from some higher power, you must do this, you must do that, then people will break the rules. Some people will, the more, actually the more capable ones will break it actually, <laughs> tend to dare to break it. So some scientists see ethics, will discover ethics as a biological evolutionary necessity, which is the relevant understanding and the realistic one, and thus are not distracted from their driving motivation to improve the lives of themselves and all others. All enlightenment-oriented core curriculum should seek, and enlightenment-oriented core curriculum should seek to produce ethical persons as a first prerequisite, which involves helping students be wakeful and lucid in their actions of body, speech, and mind. So mindfully activate. They should, they should mindfully activate. 
It should produce altruistic social actors determined to make their lives a central purpose, the improvement of the lives of others, whether through a profession, politics, business, or the arts. It almost goes without saying that it should awaken an appetite for lifelong learning and sharing their learning through realistic speech with others by educating them skillfully. When the Dalai Lama, oh, I said the story, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When the Dalai Lama accepted an honorary degree from Columbia University, he thanked the assembled dignitaries among faculty, trustees, and students, praising the role of education as essential to personal and social well being. But then he expressed his concern about our curriculum at the time, as he understood it, saying that it was too much focused on producing a clever brain and not enough on producing a good heart. A clever brain without a good heart, he continued, is unsatisfying to its possessor and perhaps even dangerous to the society. All nodded with smiles and approval, but change has been slow to come. <laughs> I love that. So then the new heading we have. I'm, I'm sorry, I told the story ahead of time. I didn't realize that I naturally won't tell it. I can tell another one about, about uh, uh, me at Columbia. At Columbia, I taught a course, which was a new course that had never been taught there, in the department of, from the Department of Religion and Philosophy. At that time, it was one department, which was better than just religion, actually. Well, that's not the case in most places. And uh, we had a tradition where all the faculty listens to each new course, and they can therefore say something about it, which is quite a good one, but it's only doable on a small scale, small college. So one guy jumped up and said, you can't teach that Buddhist ethics because Buddhists don't have ethics. I said, what? He said, no. He said, I don't mean they don't, might, some Buddhists might not do something good, but they don't do it ethically because why? And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, because they don't have a self. So he knew a little something about Buddhism, about the teaching of selflessness, but he doesn't realize it. I said, of course they have a self. Don't be nonsensical. They just have a selfless self, I said. And then he kind of, people laughed, and he kind of shut up, even though it was a profound kind of statement. He didn't know what to make of that. And, uh, but they let it go then, you know. But then what was fun is, after I did that, some of my colleagues there who were mostly Protestants at that time, they said, oh, wow, we're going to teach a course called Christian Ethics. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, don't you always teach that? He said, no, we never dared teach that, because religion departments and secular college are really not allowed, because then they think you're just going to brainwashing people, indoctrinating them to be Christians, or to be more faithful or something, if they are Christian already, instead of being secular. Oh, I said, oh, that's interesting. And then later there was Jewish ethics and Muslim ethics, and that department started doing that, which was great. I said. And I don't, that hasn't happened at Columbia since I came there, although I've taught Buddhist ethics there. But I don't think there have been, I haven't seen them daring, because the secularism at Columbia is more aggressive, let's maybe, because Columbia prides itself on that. And the natural scientists are all powerful. And so then they would get all upset. Religion department is going around trying to indoctrinate people and make them into Buddhists or Christians or Hindus or whatever it is. So they may think that, may have thought that about me, in fact, indeed, which is absolutely not the case. I used to tell them in the religion department that we're the safest of all because we don't believe in God. <laughs> so the secular should be most comfortable with us. Yeah, actually, we do believe in God. We just don't think it's the creator. We don't think there's one all-powerful one. We think there are such things as God, so that's a little more tricky. But never mind. So, anyway. Now, here's a new heading. The Inner Sciences and the Love of Wisdom. Shakyamuni Buddha was the founder of the inner science tradition in our recorded history in India, and he therefore, and therefore the founding philosophical scientist, uh, philosopher scientist of the Indian Buddhist inner scientific philosophical traditions. From, but, but they were what I didn't when I wrote this. I wasn't thinking so much as I do nowadays in my Vajra Yoga curriculum, con, you know, uh, context. I wasn't thinking so much of the fact that all of the great founders of the different Brahminical philosophical traditions, Vedanta, Vimamsa, uh, Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, they, some, some theistic and some non-theistic, 
but they were all Buddhas. They were part of the Buddha team. Buddha taught Buddha for everybody. They taught Buddha for Brahmins, usually. So for the higher class people, maybe Brahmins and Kshatriyas, you know, or, you know, military and intellectual. They taught for them. They didn't teach for the lower classes. So that was the only difference, really, but Buddha and them, is that they were still more wedded to their caste system from the Vedic period, before there was the full-scale moksha, liberation idea. But they brought in the liberation idea in various ways, and even the Mimansa reinterpreted the Vedic thing, which didn't have it, as being really meaning it or something like that. They found it in the Vedic thing, because you can find everything in everything if you're a good scientist, actually. You can. So, a good philosopher. So, for many centuries, his legacy tradition was not called Buddhism, in fact, in India, by other Indians who weren't considered themselves his follower. Buddhatta, they didn't say Buddhatta, Buddhatva, Buddhism, like that. They didn't say that. But rather, inner science, Adhyatma Vidya, Adhyatma Vidyavan, they called them. And that's why in Tibetan, for example, the word for Buddhist is translated by translating from Indian literature, they translate it as Nangba, which means insider. And that insider can be taken as inside sort of the Buddhist community, or it can be taken as a nang, nangirigpa den, you know, one who pursues inner science, which is what it went in India, inside science. In other words, focusing their sciences on the way the mind works, actually, as the, pri as the premier science. Because the premier, if you want to improve human life, you improve people's understanding of how their minds works. Because the key element in having a good life of being happy is being more in charge of and more aware of your reactions to circumstances. It isn't so much in rearranging the circumstances. Of course, rearranging them is not completely unimportant. You have to rearrange them not to be harmful, not to be dangerous, not to eat poison, not to kill people, not to be in war all the time, blah, blah, blah. You, of course, have to do that. You have to grow food and so on, eat food, good food. But, but more, you can be happy as a poor person and you're miserable as a rich person, etc. You know, I mean, we all know that. That is the case. Even though we, get, if we forget that and think, well, richness is all I want. You know? But then there are so many miserable and depressed and suicidal even rich persons. It's not, it's not circumstances being sort of ideal is not enough. It, your, your reactions have to be optimal and to learn about how to react and not to, how not to react that's the province of science of psychology as a science and it's the province of mental ethics and that's really key okay so he first discovered emptiness relativity he theory of relativity he first began before Einstein thousands of years and taught the two-reality theory of relative and absolute, or superficial and ultimate realities. So the idea of an absolute transcendent thing and a relational thing, and the way you use that, and we understand how that works, and how it, there's a cognitive dissonance involved in it, and how you regulate that cognitive dissonance and don't allow it to paralyze you, and in fact, allow it to make you a springboard into communion, an experience with the object that you're trying to understand, so you understand it by cat scanning it and becoming one with it. He was the master of that. So he was known as the inner scientist, and his followers were the inner scientists. They were also bhikshus and followers of Buddha that they were taught, of, of Shakyamuni Buddha. But, um, but that's how they were, they, were, they weren't the, the way they say, Bauda. That was only quite late that they began to call the Buddhists Bauda, when they were more distinct from themselves. They realized the distinctness because of the Buddhist little bit creating an exception to the caste system within the Buddhist community. That made them nervous, but also it became a very important valve, safety valve in the Brahminical society, so that people could move up and down in the caste system in, in one of two, in one other way than the previous way. The only way you could move up from a lower caste to becoming a, a ruling caste person would be by being a warrior in wartime, fighting intercity state wars. And if you were a hero in that war, you could become a kshatriya, having been an, a low caste, farmer caste person, or even a dirt, dirt dealing caste person. You could become a king by saving your Brahmins. They would then 
make an exception for you. But that was the only way to move between the castes because they were very powerfully, you know, ide ideologized as coming from God, if you understand, the gods. Whereas the mendicants created a new way to move up and down in caste. So it was actually, that's why it was tolerated, because it was a safety valve for the existing ruling caste. So it had a double, it, it challenged them, but in a way the challenge, they needed that challenge, and it sort of in, injected democracy into their otherwise imperialist tendencies using the rigidity of the caste system, if you take that sociological analysis. So the true reality system is very important here. He was not a dogmatic religious teacher, but rather a dialectical educator, you know, like through conversation, through getting people to think by de debating and so forth, like Socrates or even a super psychotherapist engaged in realistic speech when teaching and thus healing different individuals according to their specific needs. He was also a skilled sociologist and had a deep understanding of the social and cultural currents of his era and, his, and in its future. And so the teaching and the educational a movement he founded was strategically designed to affect changes in society as well as changes in individuals. Although he was born and educated to be a king of one of the important Indian city-states of the time, we can actually consider him the initiator of a cool revolution, is what I call it, designed to gradually change his caste-ridden warrior and priest-dominated patriarchal society into the more egalitarian, open, civilized, enlightenment-oriented society it eventually became, a gentle society, which is why, of course, it was able to be so badly conquered in the short run, but in the long run, why its culture will dharma conquer the world, actually. We will see that. The Beatles were the beginning. <laughs> they were, they got inspired by it by Hindu culture and mangoes to reverse the British Empire, if you will. After the British Empire had withdrawn from India, but they still were treated. And then there are many other people, but the Beatles were really helpful. So during his lifetime, so yeah, he invented a form of mendicant monasticism to counter the warrior militarism of his times and to serve as the nucleus of the educational institutions, the monastic universities, the Buddhaversities, that gradually sprang up. During his, that's a cool revolution, so it, it, a fake hot revolution, it's not fake, but a hot revolution means some people get so alienated, they rise up and they kill off the ruling castes, but then they unfortunately fit into the old cultural structure and they become a ruling caste, and they, and they oppress people even more because they got there by violence. So they use violence more recklessly than those trained in the good ideals of kingship in traditional societies. You know, like Chinese emperor, Confucian emperorship, or Brahminical laws of Manu kind of emperorship, not laws of Arthashastra or of Kautilya, not Machiavellian laws, but laws of, but sort of spiritual laws of kingship, which are possible you know, somewhat. But still, the king thing basically, and the rich caste thing, it, it tends to get rigid and it's not good. So, so that's, that's really deep. That, that, that's correct, that analysis. I, I approve. I <laughs> thank you, Dal. I like it. During his lifetime, he kept his most radical, centrist philosophical teachings largely esoteric among the advanced students, as the times were not yet ready for them. He predicted you too many people into emptiness and openness and freedom at its radical level will confuse it with nihilism, that caused in those ancient times. He predicted that a great mendicant and teacher with the word naga, which means dragon, in his name, a type of mythical water spirit being, part dragon and part serpent, yet able to manifest as human, that's of the dragon spirit beings, and serpent spirit beings, Kundalini types, in his name, would emerge around four centuries later, he predicted that, and spread the more radical teaching more widely then, when the culture would be ready to absorb it, because people were more, were more, were more free from the absolutized theistic thing 
uh, from the high priest that uh, lower caste, uh, that there wasn't sort of a liberation possibility for the individual. So that the, so, the, but, so they were more ready for individuals to really find real inner freedom without them dangerously becoming nihilistic and then becoming savage, if you will, by becoming nihilistic. Widespread nihilism was predicted by all Buddhist Buddhas and also Hindu Buddhas at the time as, being, as leading to savage type of society very destructive because there's no consequence ultimately to how you behave. So you just do whatever, so you lose all ethics and you do whatever you can get away with. And they, there were philosophers who tried to teach that even then, one called Charvaka. And, uh, but he was, that, that theory was considered dangerous by Buddhists and theists and monotheists within India, all of the enlightened teachers of the auxiliary. Sure enough, Nagarjuna, around 100 before the Common Era to 500. He lived for 600 years to, sorry, just have to take it, this different notion of what a miracle is. How it's true, there's no supernatural thing. There are supernormal things, all right? And he lived 600 years for a purpose. So Nagarjuna showed up and still today is considered worldwide to be one of the most important world philosophers. And scientists, They're then, but, well, people, philosophers are not necessarily considered scientists. In our backward culture, they're considered humanists. So that's the less important of the things. Nothing. Get no salary for that. <laughs> and it's just cocktail party talk. And maybe for lawyers, it's useful because they can learn to reason and argue and win points. But, and do win debates. But it's not considered important because it's not considered necessary for science. And that's a, that's a big mistake. That's a big mistake in all of our universities. I'm sorry, Harvard. That has to be changed. You have to change that because you're producing people who are destroying life. I'm sorry. There are lots of good people, too. Even those people are good. The They're just confused. Out. So you have to change your curriculum. Put philosophy back in the center. What's the meaning of life has to be put back in the center. Okay, Nagarjuna did. Buddhists often call him a second Buddha. And the profound concept of the emptiness of all things, voidness, relativity, the freedom of all things, which he rediscovered as the central focus of the universal vehicle, Transcendent Wisdom Sutras, totally reshaped, that totally reshaped the character of Indian and Pan-Asian thought and education. Totally. His not, that became central to every other even the yogis and the sankhyas, and they took, they took heart from that, actually. They didn't necessarily realize it directly because they were always a little scared of the mendicants because even though they had the universities where they would study and they had the grammar they developed and they developed the aesthetics and they developed botany and all sorts of things because of the mental freedom of the students. So they respected them and the king supported them and the, and the non-Buddhists went to study with them but then they didn't make them into Buddhists by studying with them, but they made them more intellectually powerful. So it affected them all, though. Although then they said, well, my version of it is not quite so radical, and yet it liberates my reasoning, liberates my logic, liberates my grammar, my aesthetics, and everything, and my yoga. So it had that impact on those, you know, those Buddhaversities. Okay. Uh, his non-dualist centrist teachings largely reinforced the mendicant monastic institutions and enabled them to expand into flourishing universities because it made them less dogmatic about being Buddhists, actually, also. It made them more open to teaching their teaching completely within other traditions' conceptual structures, if you follow me. It's like the Dalai Lama saying he truly changed his view of the traditional Buddhist, that you have to be Buddhist to be enlightened, and he got to meet Christian enlightened beings, Muslim enlightened beings, Jewish enlightened beings. He began to see that. But he didn't have time to do that scientific secularist enlightened beings. He didn't have time to fully articulate that in such a way as they would see the pursuit of their ideals as leading to the same enlightenment, necessarily. That's our job, his heirs to do that. That's the Buddhaversity job. Many scholars will do that in different ways in different traditions to unify and avoid the danger of Christians like 
nuking all non-Christians or Muslims with their Pakistani nuclear and Saudi nuclear bombs, nuking all non-Muslims, Jews nuking all non-Jews, secularists nuking, nuking all religious people. This is the great danger because tribalistic type of mentalities with the modern technological uh, things are very, very dangerous. So we have to have more universalistic worldviews. And, and th those universalistic ideas are there in all of these traditions. And they need, and their theologies and their ideologies need to be more switched where they don't hate their enemies. If they want to debate with them, maybe they will say, we have a better idea about something, why not? Uh, about their practice, they can. But leave them in their own worlds. That's really critical to becoming unified, being communion on the whole, with all life in the whole, whole planet. That's what we have to do for survival now. We can't dominate and conquer everybody anymore. Nobody can. It's impossible. The last so-called conquerors, world conquerors, by violence are intolerable now. And there is an awakening among the people that this cannot happen. It's because it leads to endless violence, that's all. Can't, it doesn't lead to any kind of golden age. Never. Golden age is when everybody is free. That's what we've proven, actually. <laughs> Hollywood has proves, proves it every day. Okay. The, Hollywood also can be inf infected by them, and then they try to glorify past conquerors. Yes, Hollywood can do that. But, it's, but creative people tend not to do that. Suddenly, they won't glorify them because they see, their, see how pathetic they were. People who, who are violent on other people, they don't have fun. They don't have good sex. They're not happy themselves. They run around scratching their tits here under their coat while they're like having everybody freeze to death in the step. <laughs> or their own people. They go crazy. Human beings are not meant to behave like that. We're not gorillas. We are like loving beings. We have soft skin. We have caress it. We want to caress and be caressed. We don't want to kill, actually. We don't enjoy it. We may have to for food or something at some stage, some kind of hunter. But we don't want it. So now survival instinct is supported by gentleness, by understanding, by empathy, by compassion. That's how it is. Survival will not happen by violence. It's mutual destruction is totally possible. That's really critical. Because we've, we've become more realistic with our technology, but not with our psychology. That's what we have to become. Okay, so this culture persisted for many centuries, and realistic speech served human needs as well, so well that it spread throughout Asia without any kind of crusade, and individual students came to the universities, the Buddhaversities, from all over as far east as China and as far west as Iran, possibly even Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. The Tibetan Empire began sending scholars to the Indian universities from the, for example, Tibetan Conquest Empire around fifth, sixth centuries, seventh centuries. The Tibetan Conquest Empire, among conquest empires, began sending scholars that's why I couldn't have jumped there historically because it's not a book of history, so I couldn't follow through to get from the early, uh, you know, spread at the time of the spread of Christianity, Mahayana Buddhism, Nagarjuna, all of these universalistic Hinduism, Vedanta, all of these things spreading everywhere uh, at that time to jumping that to then when a, a conquest dynasty connected to the Buddhaversity this was in the form of the Tibetan one, which was a nearby empire in the high altitude. Just go over the pass and you come down the river valley and you're in India. So uh, that's a big jump there, but that's because that's so that the book is. The Tibetan Empire began uh, sending scholars to the Indian universities from the 7th century. And Tibet gradually informed its imperial uh, Somehow, my gosh, or something is going on in my eyesight. So it's imperial, militaristic, yes. Uh, um, conquest culture into a dedicated uh, vessel of the inner sciences, inner science culture. 
uh, translating the great books of the Indian Buddhaversities, libraries, and adopting the inner science curriculum and developing the, the experimental person-to-person -person pra practitioners lineages and the great adepts lineages as well. Therefore, a thousand years ago, when the peacefulness of the Indian nations educated in this way made them vulnerable to invasions by more violent cultures from the north and west, the Tibetans were able to maintain the tradition and refine it further right up to the present day, when it too was violently destroyed by British imperial and Chinese communist colonial invasion in the 20th century. The resilience and power of Tibet, visible in development, visible in exile still today, come from its thousand-year educational development and cultural transformation that instilled in its people at home and in exile a deep dedication to the protection of realistic speech. That's really it. And also they proved the power of it by gradually uh, changing, receiving the Mongolian conquest culture and gradually teaching the Mongolians the better way of living nonviolently than violently. And the Mongolian Empire was the biggest land empire in all world history, for sure, and lasted for four or five centuries, actually. But then when it, as it gradually became nonviolent, then the Mongolians joined the Tibetans in becoming this kind of nonviolent Buddhaversity, Buddhaversity educated culture. That's the, that's the point. And this is very important to us today because today we are in this state of mutual confrontation of the world wars that we experience in the world wars where conquest cultures, imperialist conquest cultures, British, French, Russian, most importantly, and at the last minute, a German and, uh, and Chinese, but, and, and Chinese, but Chinese were a little different from the all during the, but anyway, these cultures were the conquest cultures and we, they still are confronting each other as conquest cultures and they're still at war. Uh, basically, and their huge budget, huge uh, uh, budget surpluses all go to war and, and weapons, and they are facing one another, and they can, we can obliterate one another. And but now their their all outness of their conquest is restrained of the ones who are sane and don't go crazy. They're restrained by the fact that there's no winner of such conquest, conquest or, or conflict. You can't conquer everybody. If there's all out war, it will destroy all of life. It's like an asteroid. It will like destroying the dinosaurs. Nuclear war, it will be a holocaust. The new, an escalation of military is nuclear. And it will destroy everything. Then there's biological warfare education. Then there's, then there's chemical warfare education. It's completely... The, 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 the winner is also destroyed. So war is over as a useful uh, institution. But they're not recognizing it still. So now is the critical turning moment in history. We are at it. And this Buddhaversity idea is critical. It's necessary. It's not a religious thing. It's a scientific thing. Sociology and everything, physics even, will, will support it. If real physics. You know, transparent matter, transparent energy. When they go beyond the discovery of dark matter and dark energy, and they realize that bright matter and bright energy and dark matter and dark energy are all themselves subsumed under transparent matter and transparent energy. When physics reaches there, which they really have, but they're in denial of where they really reached. But when they reach there for full, then that Buddhaversity will dawn, and then that will, will make people unwilling to tolerate war leadership overall. And then it will be over. And then we won't have dictators any longer. We won't tolerate any dictator. We won't romanticize any dictatorships and any conquest ideologies any longer. There'll only be Dharma conquest, which means truth conquest, reality conquest, freedom conquest, love conquest. That's what it will be. Conquest by love. Wonderful thing. So, so, so there we are. And the example... But we're taught that can't be because we're taught that no society can give up its violence. We're taught that. We're raised in that. And because we're raised in this backward materialistic culture. But look at the Mongolian Empire and the Tibetan Empire. They did do that.
And actually, eventually, when we look more carefully, we'll find many different Indian empires did that. Actually, Ashoka's empire did that. The Maurya dynasty did that. Thousand year, 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years, 2,300 years ago, they did that. But then they kept being submerged under, because there were many dynasties. India is a continent, you know, subcontinent, many different uh, conquering things, many different nations there. Okay. And then they were conquered when they became more gentle. Amazing. So it's not, a, so we don't, it's not clear the example, you know. Imagine what a culture must be like that loves such a story as that of the crown prince Kunala, son of the emperor Ashoka in the third century BCE. Oh, I love this. Prince Kunala was famous for his beautiful eyes. His father had a much younger favorite queen for a time. He didn't, he, he, she was beautiful and she was much, much younger. He was an old emperor, funky old emperor. But he really also chose her as his favorite queen because she cured him because she was ruthless. And she cured him of a, a tapeworm that was killing him by taking prisoners in his jails because it was still, he was moving toward Dharma conquest, but he was still a rough and tough emperor, Ashoka, heir of a conquering kind of emperor. And so, and very bad in his youth, conquering his brothers and sisters, sort of like MBS today in Arabia. So he was the heir of that kind of culture. And she saved him by killing lots of prisoners after infecting them with the tapeworm and seeing what affected the tapeworm in their stomach. She did a lot of dissection, surgery, and research <laughs> and came up with a medicine that got rid of his tapeworm or whatever kind of parasite he had. And then, so then that was another reason she was a favorite queen. But anyway, being young like that, she fell in love with his beautiful son, Kunala, with the beautiful eyes. So Kunala being a favorite son by another wife, the new young queen fell in love, of course, with Kunala. But out of loyalty to his father, he rejected her advances, which was loyalty and also fear of his father, no doubt. A woman spurned, furious, she vowed revenge, Soon she took her chance when he was out leading an army in Kashmir on a campaign to pacify a rebellion. She forged an imperial edict to some generals in the field, other generals in the field, and sealed it with the emperor's tooth steel by slipping the letter into his mouth when he was sleeping. So she forged an edict by him, and in the, apparently he was such a for, forceful emperor that whenever he stamped an edict with a seal that he had in, in the crown of one of his teeth, if, and no general could disobey that, it would be death if they disobeyed that, however, whatever it said. So she forged an edict when he was sleeping, and the edict announced that he had discovered a plan by Kunala to use the army himself to rebel against the emperor and gave orders to punish him for this treason by blinding him. Such a ruthless lady, you know, a woman scorned, you know. <laughs> Indian stories are lovely. The generals thought it must be a misunderstanding because of course he, they, everyone knew how beautiful a person he was and they were very faithful and loyal to his father and didn't want to do it, but Kunala insisted because a tooth sealed edict of the emperor could not be disobeyed on pain of death. He was blinded, and so therefore he was blinded with a red hot poker. Amid the agony, the fact that he would be such a uh, virtuous prince is itself already shows the power of the true freedom, the loving freedom becoming important in Indian history and in Indian society and culture at this time. Still not the time for Mahayana only two or three centuries after Buddha, not four or five centuries, but enough to be where a prince would be like that. And, uh, and he didn't want all the generals to be ex executed. You know. Amid the agony of the first eye being burned out, as the searing pain of the eye being burned out, he remembered in a flash his previous lives, because he was obviously a Bodhisattva, actually, really especially in from previous life, especially the one, however, he remembered when he had been a bad person, not a bodhisattva, where he had been a hunter. 
and he had trapped a herd of 500 deer in a box canyon and then had blinded them all so they could not jump over the felled trees. He felled trees to block them in this box canyon and they wouldn't be able to jump over or, or wither, sneak their way through the tree blocks blocking them so he could just come back and shoot two or three every day, you know, and they wouldn't have to really chase them and hunt them but could just trap 500 of them and slaughter them but keep them alive within the canyon to be fresh to sell, you know. So he remembered a life like that. He remembered having, then he remembered having lost his own eyes in hundreds of lifetimes since as the karmic evolutionary result of having blind, blinded the 500 deer. He realized that his two beautiful eyes of this life were the last two he had to lose. He attained a deep and complete realization of nirvana then during the, so then he was all right about the second eye. He just turned his head, but go, go for it. Although the agony of the first eye being sizzled out. During the agony of the second eye being burned out, then he did attain nirvana because he was a bodhisattva. He also did a lot of good things in those 500 lives. The generals were amazed to notice that the agony was overridden by his spontaneous bliss of liberation. As his mind found refuge in the super subtle level of reality free of all suffering. So he clear lighted his way past the agony of, the, of two seared eye sockets. It's a really gr grim story. And then, and then uh, uh, amazing, really. He also realized spontaneously by a kind of clairvoyance that what they call the divine ear and divine eye. Or you can, you can see things that are happening, incidents that are being taken place in the past and the other type of lifetime, because he attained a kind of very bodhisattvic or almost Buddha nirvana. He also realized it was spontaneously that the wicked queen had conspired to send the false edict, so it wasn't really his father. And he didn't want to go back and cause her to lose her life, because he knew the father would have her killed. So he told the generals to report that he had died in battle, which they did. Then he wandered off as a mendicant beggar into the town. Soon a young woman met him, fell in love with him, blind as he was, and became his attendant. You know, he needed, he became his, uh, his uh, 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 helper. And he became well known as a wandering minstrel singer, because he had a beautiful voice also, Hunala. And he had a beautiful voice, like, it was like Stevie Wonder. <laughs> Ancient Indian Stevie Wonder. He had a beautiful voice and people loved him. He did not return to the palace or even, the, even Patna, Pataliputra, you know, the capital, Ashoka's capital, because he didn't want to, you know, be discovered in any way by his father and happily wandered free with his companion, sharing joy with all as a singer, all blissed out in nirvanic, in nirvana. In nirvanic, wisdom is bliss. He was just a wisdom is bliss. He was really a Buddha, that means, a living Buddha, but uh, not a, without the Buddha body ability, apparently, but, you know, a very high developed bodhisattva, let's say, what they, which is kind of Buddha-like bodhisattva. Then under a new heading, the importance of the teacher. Uh, the importance of the teacher. Well... Is it about an hour? Uh, you're at 55. What? 55? Yeah, 55. Okay. So that was quite lengthy over a few pages because I'm unpacking it a lot. But I hope you like it. I like it, actually. I'm enjoying. So, so I think we'll stop here then at the heading of the importance of the teacher. And maybe with that importance, I think, yeah, I will be telling stories about my teacher, so it won't be so lengthy, maybe. So we'll do another one. Next one will be on the importance of the teacher. Very important about relationship with the teacher. You know, to properly understand the whole guru role. So, he, so when we don't over-idealize it, but we also don't miss it entirely. So it's very, it's very subtle and very important. And it deserves a session on its own. And I think this session was really good on the Buddhaversity, the Buddha University, and the announcement uh, that there will be such a Buddha University in Bodhgaya now, definitely starting to build. It's, being, it's happening. It's wonderful. I think I'm so happy about it. 
So, by the Gavati in your do da, Chesam Janyan Trub Jone, Trovati Jamali Pati Sala Gurma By the merit of this, of this uh, uh, session with you, may we quickly become Manjushri's all knowing and thereby quickly able to install all beings in that stage of Manjushri themselves equal to ourselves. And thank you to Adam Foizen, the engineer, patiently hanging through this. And here we go with this session. Ding, 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 ding.